Thank you. You did a great job. Let's uh, bow for a word of prayer. Loving, merciful, gracious God and Father, uh, we do acknowledge you are the God of this city and you have greater things yet to do. And we know that those greater things are done through the hands and feet of your people. And so, Lord, we, uh, we come and we pray that you would use us, that you would continue to mold and to shape us into the people that you want us to be, that you would work in our lives in such a way that we would have an impact in our neighborhoods, in our places of employment, uh, wherever you place us, Lord, in whatever relationships that we have. And we, uh, we surrender them to you. We ask, God, that you would forgive us our sins, our failures, our shortcomings. And that through your pow power of your spirit, you might um, continue to make us more like Jesus Christ. Father, we, uh, we, we mourn with our brothers and sisters in Charleston, South Carolina, at the loss of nine who gather together to worship. And Father, we uh, thank you that your love conquers hate. We thank you that your word tells us that good overcomes evil. And we, uh, we pray, Father, that the message even of the family members who lost loved ones and declared you are forgiven is a message that resonates with the world and that they can hear that through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, even those who have been hurt deeply can extend forgiveness. Father God, I pray that you would just work in each of our lives in such a way that we continually, no matter what we face, we point people in your direction and thereby provide hope. And so, Lord, we uh, humbly come to you this morning and we ask, uh, Father, that you would speak to us again through your word. We thank you that it is true and we pray that we might take it and apply it to our own lives and thereby uh, have your word living in and through us and your spirit working through us. Lift up, I lift up families before you this day, Lord, and I pray that we might have godly homes that where children learn about you at a very early age and are nurtured in all of your truth. We ask all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We are uh, uh, going to look at uh, what it means to be a father. And in preparing for uh, the message this morning, I was looking at some things, and um, <clears throat> I guess they asked a little boy uh, what Father's Day is. And he responded, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, except you don't have to spend as much on the present. You know, f fathers, uh, <clears throat> fathers are sometimes... Uh, not thought of quite uh, right, depending upon uh, the age of the child in the home. Mark Twain uh, is quoted as saying that when uh, he was a boy of 14 years of age, he says, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to be around the old man. But when I got to be 21, I was astounded at how much the old man had learned in seven years. A perspective changes things, doesn't it? Um, <clears throat> someone, I believe, wisely said that parents spend the first part of a child's life urging him or her to talk and to walk, and the rest of childhood telling them to sit down and be quiet. Um, we're going to look at a classic passage of Scripture, a, a nugget of wisdom from the book of Proverbs. It does not say father in it. It addresses parenthood, grandparenthood. It's talking about rearing children. And it is a great principle by which uh, we should apply within our own uh, families. Uh, follow along as I read from Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. It simply says, Train up a child in the way he should go. 
even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, In a sense, sad to say to all of you kids that are out of school right now, but in a sense, we're never out of school. Uh, We should always be learning and growing. Um, This uh, life that we live on this earth is really a training ground to fit us for eternity. And so as fathers and mothers, we are called upon to uh, use the influence that we have on our children to teach them the right direction, to help steer them in the right way. Um, And we need to always remember the principles in Scripture to instruct bringing up our children in the training and the admonition of the Lord, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Um, We're just going to kind of break down this verse uh, from Proverbs. And uh, I have uh, your outline has three A's, okay, to help you remember. Um, First is the age of training our our children. Um, It says train up a child. Uh, It's a a specific uh, Hebrew word talking about uh, the younger ages. uh, And, you know, at that time, childhood is the proper period for schooling. It, it, God just puts it into us that we're, uh, when we're young, we're very curious and we're, we're discovering the world and we're learning everything all around us. Uh, all of you parents and grandparents can remember the times in which uh, as, as a little one, uh, your, your little ones were discovering things. And uh, much to the chagrin of moms many times, there was a period of time in which they discover everything through their mouth, right? Uh, As soon as they uh, uh, grab a hold of something, it instantly goes in in the mouth. Um, And that that training, we we likewise uh, are are always involved in kind of helping them learn and grow. Uh, Have you ever watched a parent feeding a little one? Have you? Okay. What did they do when they put the spoon to the little one's mouth? Open their mouth. You cannot, you not, try it sometime. You cannot keep your mouth closed and put a spoon at a little one's because they're watching us, they're mimicking us, they respond to our smiles, they're just taking in everything. And the Scripture is telling us that in in childhood, a part of our our responsibility is to train them, to uh, use that opportunity, that inquisitiveness that God has built into them to train them in the right direction. Solomon, known in Scripture as the wisest man, uh, he, he made this conclusion uh, 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 after seeking all kinds of things in all different kinds of avenues. He said, remember uh, your Creator in the days of your youth before difficult days come and the years draw near when uh, you say, I have no pleasure in them. His counsel is, in other words, we need to know God early on in our life. The earlier, the better, uh, because it, it saves us from a lot of grief and a lot of difficulties. Uh, as we get older, things change. As we get older, we get set in our ways. As we get older, time passes in a different way. I can remember my dad telling me and my brother when we were uh, yet in school, he said, boys, enjoy this time in your life. Uh, when, when you're young, because as you get older, time goes faster. To which I thought, Dad, there's 24 hours in a day, no matter how old you are. Now I know exactly what he means. When I was a kid, I waited, it seemed like, for eternity for Christmas. And now it seems like you're always planning ahead and it's flying by. And it's just rushing past us all. Um, so childhood is that that age in our lives in which there are impressions and innocence and interest, and we need to use all of those things in the lives of our children to, to engage them and to teach them the right things. There's the age of training our children. There's the art of parenting as well. It says train up a child in the way he should go. The way he should go. The Hebrew literally reads initiate a child in accordance with his way. 
in accordance with his way. His way means that either his future calling or his character and vocational inclination. And both are true. Uh, both were true in scriptural times. Uh, let me give you a few examples. If, uh, if you were growing up in Bible times in which uh, the, this proverb was written, if your dad was a carpenter and you were a young man, guess what you would be? A carpenter. If dad was a rabbi, you would be a rabbi. Um, you, you followed in that path. Um, early on in our nation, we had a lot of that uh, as well. They were called apprenticeships, right? In which you, you, you went into a trade and you were taught by uh, those who already knew the trade and you kind of worked alongside them and learned all the things involved in that job. That's, that's one way of training. The other way of training is, uh, is in accordance with their character. And what that means, literally, it means that we need to train up a child in the way of their own particular bent, their own particular personality. Now, I'll tell you, uh, you know, Justin and Emily are two years apart. And to be quite honest, you know, about the time that Emily arrived, Melinda and I kind of thought we had this parenting thing down. Um, it, 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 was, it was just, you know, we knew him, and we knew what made him tick, and we knew how he worked, and, and we thought the next one would be just the same. It wasn't that way at all. Not in the least bit. And so suddenly we had a new pupil, and we had to learn all over again what makes this little one tick. And uh, what, wh how, how does she work? And how does she respond? And, and you treat them equal, but you do not treat them the same. You treat them according to their bent. You, you become good parents, become good students of their children. We study our children so that we can lead them in the right way, so that we can understand what how can I steer this one? Um, and my hat's off to all of you who have three and four children and more. Obviously, God knew what he was doing because we could only handle two. Um, <clears throat> we, we are called to uh, uh, lead them and understand that there's an eternity at stake when we're talking about our own children. John MacArthur, in writing about this verse, he says, since it is axiomatic that early training secures lifelong habits, parents must insist upon this way, teaching God's word. Early on in our parenting, I vowed that I would not say, because I said so. Because I did not want everything to be the final authority on me. And so... We learn to say, because God's word says. And we gave them God's word. And if nothing else fails, we went back to, God's word says, honor your father and your mother. But it all goes back to God, because he's the ultimate authority. And we need to lead our children in that direction. Um, training involves three things, uh, scripturally speaking. It involves demonstration, it involves education, and it involves uh, correction. So in other words, demonstration, by example. Um, education, by instruction. And correction, by discipline. Uh, we all make mistakes, we need to learn. Now dads, we all know that there are certain things that we just kind of, we kind of do with our kids and we help them learn certain things. Uh, for example, how to put a worm on a hook, how to get the fish off the hook, uh, how to uh, ride a bike after the training wheels uh, come off, and um, I I how to drive a car. I know moms do that too, but at least in my household, dad did it because it made mom too nervous. Um, and we, we do those things, uh, but there are some other things that we need to do that are vitally, vitally important. And this does not show up on the outline. And from my previous church, this is exactly where the people would say he stopped preaching and he, he went to meddling. 
But this is important, okay? I'm just going to give you five things, five things, men, that we need to take seriously about uh, instructing, um, being an example, and uh, uh, directing our children. First one is how to treat a woman right, okay? Um, when... Um, <clears throat> When an elderly gentleman in my previous church passed away, I met with the family, and the family said, uh, well, one of the sons and one of the grandsons wanted to speak. And I said, that's wonderful. You know, whenever any family want to share, that, that is great. The grandson, he, he was actually in junior high when I first came to the church, and so he was kind of one of my own. Um, and he was, he, he had graduated from college, uh, got his career had recently gotten married, and he had been married for just less than a year. And he got up, and he said, Grandpa, thank you for teaching me how to faithfully love one woman for a lifetime. I don't remember what else the young man said, to be perfectly honest, but that stuck with me because what he was saying was, Grandpa, you set a wonderful example of what it means to be a faithful husband. Men, listen to me. How we treat our wives tells the next generation how those relationships ought to be. Our daughters look at us, and if we do not treat our wives properly, if we verbally, emotionally, physically abuse our wives, then guess what? our daughters will think that that is normal and that is acceptable and that is okay and it is not. But if we lift our wives up, if we honor our wives as the Scriptures tell us, if we place them in a place of honor in the light of our children and in the light of our own lives, guess what? Our daughters will look for the same kind of thing. Our sons also look to us as an example. And if they think that a wife is nothing but a piece of property, guess what? That's what they'll go about treating women that way. We need to be honorable in how we treat our wives. Secondly, how we put the Lord first. Men, thank you for being in worship here this morning. Um, I believe with all my heart that one of the greatest tragedies that could ever happen is that we as Christian parents could lose our children for eternity. And I'm telling you, men, it's vitally important that you put the Lord first in your life. If mom's the one that's always taking the kids to church and you stay behind, guess what? You are subtly teaching them that God doesn't matter. And you need to be the example. And it's not just in worship, but do they see you read your Bible? Do they hear you pray? By your example, you let them know that God matters, that He's a part of your life. And likewise, they can follow in that same path. Thirdly, I would say, how do you and I master our mouths, our tongues? You know, James tells us that uh, this tongue of ours is a fire from hell. It can go do great damage. And in those years in which kids are growing up, they're very vulnerable. So how do we speak? How do we speak to them? How do we speak um, when we're going through struggles and trials? Do we point them to the God who has the answers? Or do we cry out in expletives? Which means me to the fourth one, which is how do you handle anger? We all have it, right? We're in church, be honest. We all have anger, right? Okay. It is a natural human emotion. And there is a right way and a wrong way to handle it. Jesus himself had anger. 
He went into the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers. He, with a whip, drove them out of the house of God, which was a house of prayer that they had turned into a marketplace. Um, he demonstrated some wrath from God. There is a place, a rightful place for anger, but oftentimes when our anger gets out of control, we say and do things that we should never do and that do not bring godly results. Am I right? Okay, I'm just trying to make sure you're tracking with me, okay? And the final and the fifth thing and the most important thing is are you demonstrating to your children how to go to heaven? I am not talking about being a good person. I am talking about acknowledging that every single one of us are sinners and we have failed God tremendously and it's not just that we're weak it's that we have intentionally done things against the law and the will of God and we all if we stood in our own merits God rightfully should banish us but through the mercy of God he sent his son Jesus Christ to take our sins upon the himself on the cross of Calvary and Jesus died and rose from the dead so that we by faith in him could have everlasting life and have the power of God and the very presence of God through his Holy Spirit in our lives and be transformed people. Do your children know that? Do they know your testimony? Do they know how God saved you? You see, if we want them to go to heaven... They need to know the way. And yes, by all means, you need to have them in a church where that's taught and preached. But they need to hear it from us too. They need to see it in us. So there's an age, there's an art, and there's an aim. There's an aim to parenting our children. And it goes to the very last thing that I mentioned. That is... There is only one right way of life that which leads us to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now to some people, they think that's very narrow. How dare you say that? And I'll be honest with you, how dare we question <laughs> Because God actually made a way. The, the, the reality is, we don't deserve a way. But He made a way. And how dare we point our finger at the God of heaven and say, one way? I want to do it my own way. Who's God? That's the question. If He is truly God, then we need to Abide by the way in which He made it possible. And in His mercy, He's so good to us by sending His Son, Jesus Christ. And so part of the role of us as parents is to direct our children in the right way and to train them in the Word of God so that the soil of their heart might be, might be ready for the seed of the truth of the Gospel. It wouldn't be rocky or hard or, or uh, full of weeds. Um, in 2 Timothy, Paul, writing to Timothy, said that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. What was he saying? He was saying, Timothy, because of the upbringing that you had, because you were you were building your life on the foundation of the truth of the Word of God, you were ready to receive the Lord Jesus Christ because you were being nurtured in that way. And that's what we need to do in Christian homes. The Scripture says, in the way that he should go. That literally could be translated, in his way. His, capital H, God's way. In God's way suggesting that every single child, every single person,
God has a special plan and a purpose for our lives. Do you believe that? He has a plan and a purpose for every single one of our lives. Um, scripture tells us that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God's already prepared a path for every single one of us to walk in. And so part of our role as parents is to help direct our children to that rightful path in which they can use their God-given abilities and talents to honor the Lord with their life. Again, from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, um, Solomon concludes with this. He says, The conclusion when all has been heard is, Fear God and keep His commandments, because this applies to everyone. We need to reverently live in awareness of the living God and live in such a way that we honor and bless Him. Jesus said, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. We need to direct our children in that way. Just a couple more statements and we'll close. Fathers, <clears throat> we need to remember, most importantly, to train our children to seek God and to know Him personally through His Son, Jesus Christ. And men, we need to recognize and acknowledge our role in our household in such a way and take responsibility to understand that we can change the future for our children and our grandchildren. My dad was not raised by his parents. His father was not in his life whatsoever. And yet there wasn't a moment in my life or in my brother's life that my dad wasn't there. He faithfully came home after work. He provided for his family. He demonstrated that he loved my mother dearly. He changed our future. He didn't make any excuses for what he was dealt, but he chose to do something different. And because he did, my life's different. My kids' lives are different. We need to take responsibility for what we're called to do. And I've been talking to dads and kind of moms, but I want to address the kids for a moment. You need to thank your dad. <laughs> you need to say thank you. Um, I didn't know until I was an adult what my dad had really done, and I really didn't fully understand until I became a parent what he had done and the sacrifices that he had made and the choices that were made that um, clearly showed he favored his family more than some of his own preferences. So if your father's still here on this earth, make sure you say thanks and mean it. And if your father's not here, thank your heavenly father for your dad and what he's done. And we're going to close with this. I had the service completely planned out differently until a couple days ago. And I saw this video, and I've never had an invitation by video before. But we're going to do it today. Um, in just a moment... Uh, Levi and Leah Mullen are going to tell you a little bit about their life because they were fatherless and they became fatherful. And they described not only the family that they were adopted into, but they describe how we can all be adopted into the heavenly family through our loving Heavenly Father. Watch this. <laughs> I don't really remember.
not a pretend dad. Or a punch your dad. Or anything that's than my really dad. And I'm his really daughter. And I'm his really son. It's, it's a pretty, pretty good deal, deal actually. actually. There are a lot of people in this world who don't have a father. Or who have a bad father. Maybe that's your story. Or maybe you can't even imagine being loved. No matter your situation, we got some really great news. There's a heavenly father, and he's a really, really good daddy. And when you choose him, God adopts you into his family. And he becomes not a pretend dad, or a partial dad, or anything less than your real dad. And we become his really child. bow with me in prayer. Father God, thank you that you want everyone to be in your family. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus to make that possible. And thank you that by faith in him, we can be adopted into your eternal family. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who needs to take that step of faith and say, Lord, I turn from my sins and I turn to you. I trust you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior. And I ask you to come in to my life to cleanse me, to take me into your family. And Father God, I pray for the families that are represented by everyone in this sanctuary this day. And I pray, Father, that we would be godly people with godly homes where Christ is honored and we honor one another and love one another genuinely. And thereby have an impact in our community as well. And I pray for any and all who, like me, willingly acknowledge we fall short. We're, we miss the mark on all that we should be as husbands and fathers. And God, we ask that you would forgive us and that you would help us to do better. And Lord, I pray that you would also help us as your children and as children in homes to be grateful for all that you do and all the blessings that are ours through the gift of our earthly parents and through all the ways in which you provide for our every need. We ask all these things in the loving name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. The invitation is very simple. Um, we're going to stand and sing in a moment, and I extend this invitation. If you would like to be a part of God's family, I invite you to come and share that with me, and I would gladly pray with you. If you uh, want to uh, rededicate your life and your household to the Lord, feel free to do that. Maybe God's calling you to be a part of this church family. I'd ask you to, uh, to respond as we stand and sing together, O Master, let me walk with thee.